It's a great joy and honor to be speaking here today, albeit remotely, but it's also quite difficult. As Oli's interests and skills range wide, and it's hard to compress my admiration for her into a paper on any single topic. I first met her when I was on a lecture tour of Germany at, I think, the turn of the century. And she picked me up in Mainz railway station. She had a broken arm, but nothing would prevent her from meeting and helping a visitor. With a characteristic combination of warmth, empathy and efficiency, that is absolutely extraordinary. On later visits to Mainz, I've been impressed by the atmosphere, academic integrity and humanity that has been created here. And my own attempts to replicate such an atmosphere elsewhere have taught me that that is quite a considerable achievement. Her academic work needs absolutely no summary from me, but I'll speak a little about gender in a famous text with quite a bit of hieratic in the hope that this will amuse her. It draws on a project of commentating on Egyptian poems that owes a lot to her support and work, and also to a visit many years ago to Mainz. I'll first talk about the modern reception of the Queen in the Middle Kingdom poem, The Life of Sinuhe, that I know was memorably performed here with Uli some years ago. And then I'll consider the Queen's role in the actual poem as we experience it as readers. Now, heteronormative concepts of gender run deep in Egyptology, as does colonialism. We've only to look at the celebrations of the anniversaries of the past year to see how deeply the stereotype of the Egyptologist as a heroic white male bringing light to the darkness of Africa is embedded in our discipline. Oh, those great adventurers, Champollion and Carter. These stereotypes have also shaped philology, including Sinuhe, and popular literature has often provided an interpretive framework for supposedly objective scientific approaches. The hero of Sinuhe is apparently a follower, basically a bodyguard, such as one sees on the marble tomb walls. And his autobiography was often entitled his Adventures, by early translators. In 1895, a review of Flinders Petrie's translation said that it reminded the reader somewhat of Mr. Ryder Haggard's ingenious African romances. Now, Haggard's novels included She, A History of Adventure, 1886 to 7, which has been repeatedly filmed ever since, and it features She as a dangerous but fascinating female leader. Haggard's novels drew on his experiences as a colonial administrator in Africa and included some rather unfortunate images and phrases, such as this illustration of the white hero battling a mass of Africans, captioned, above them towered his beautiful, pale face. Haggard also collected antiquities and manufactured the fictional inscribed Shard of Amenartis, which is central to the plot of She, and which is now in the Norwich Castle Museum, suggesting how closely colonialism, collections, the occult, and popular literature were intertwined. Now, Haggard wrote other more historical yarns of ancient Egypt, and his second intermediate period romance, Queen of the Dawn, also displays attitudes to women, that are very characteristic of the period. In this review, there are no eternal disquisitions such as spoiled some few of the last books, nor is the heroine supernatural in any way. Indeed, she is a modern flapper unmistakably for all her queendom and her destiny. Writers like Haggard were heavily influenced by the works of Sir Wallace Budge, and it's notable that Budge's own memoirs were denounced by the great English novelist E.M. Forster in 1920, for their nationalism and their colonialist yarns of daring do. These adventure stories were a deeply toxic paradigm for Egyptology and the reception of ancient Egyptian literature. One clear example of the highly gendered tropes is Sax Roma's Brood of the Witch Queen of 1918, a tale of Oxford Egyptological student life, so I am quite fond of it. <coughs> the hero is the predictably masculine Robert Cairn, a tall, thin Scotsman, clean-shaven, square-jawed, and with the crisp light hair and grey eyes, which often bespeak unusual virility. The villain is Anthony Ferrara, the reborn child of Egypt's ancient witch queen, who is a familiar Orientalist stereotype. The almond-shaped eyes, black as night, gleamed strangely beneath the low, smooth brow. His lips were very red. 
In his whole appearance, there was something repellently effeminate. The contrast between modern manhood and the ancient East is strong. The novel utilizes the Book of Thoth, written in strange characters, alas, so much for hieratic, and is full of sinister Orientalism. Lotuses that sap the virgin heroine's life as they flower, human sacrifice inside a secret chamber in the Maidum Pyramid, and even an elemental thing, always with a capital T. The heroine is Myra Duquesne, a radiant vision in white. The light gleamed through her soft brown hair, forming a halo for a face that Robert Cairn knew for the sweetest in the world. She is, predictably, his ideal of womanhood, of love. Passive, but with clairvoyant tendencies, she has a tendency to faint and swoon. The modern hero, of course, destroys both the occult book and the queer Ferrara, ensuring that the dangers of the ancient East are rendered extinct, as was Haggard's she in the flames of that first novel. She, of course, came back and remains a much more interesting figure than the pallid and very conventional Myra. So this is how popular Egyptology regarded women when Sinuhe was first studied. And this all shaped the reception of Sinuhe's patroness in the poem, Queen Nefru. The early reception of Egyptian literature was trivializing, aimed at entirely easy and entertaining reading, in the words of that 1925 review of Haggard. The Australian writer Guy Boothby rewrote Sinuhe into a sensationalist tale of reincarnation, a professor of Egyptology in 1904. It's an occult sensationalist short story, which involves romance between Sinuhe and the Queen. The woman is Cecilia Westmoreland, an independently-minded Yorkshire woman, who turns out to be the reincarnation of Nofrit, a woman caught between the two rival brothers, Sinuhet and Usertasen. The names are taken from Maspro's early translation. Sinuhet loves her, but he believes that she betrays him to his rival, and so he stabs her, just as his brother becomes king. Here the narrative tropes are painfully obvious. It is occult, a mummy story, orientalizing with sibling rivalry, and with the gender stereotypes of heteronormative romance. Sinuhe's queen is reconfigured as his love interest, and her reincarnation, of course, forgives him in a very properly seemly womanly manner. The historian James Bakey later said in his History of Egypt that Sinu had described a palace crisis in an ancient oriental state with all the intrigue and uncertainty of a doubtful succession. The orientalistic motif of a family conspiracy was also dramatized in a 1920s play by Terence Gray, a wealthy Irish gentleman with an interest in modernist theater and in Egyptology. He fused Sinuhe and the teaching of Amenemhat into a play entitled The Nameless, The Harim Conspiracy. There is no romance here, but the Harim conspiracy is an idea that, of course, has plagued Egyptological discussions of the motivations for Sinuhe's flight. And the proximity of such articulations to mainstream Egyptology is visible in the fact that the volume was illustrated by Winifred Brunton. In this version, Queen Nefru vanishes from the plot and is replaced with a generic Orientalist Harim. Why do you need an individual woman when you can have a whole Harim? Later receptions have often with a startling, a very startling consistency, imagine that Sinuhe is in love with, or is having an affair with, Queen Nefru. Mostly, this has been done by fictional writers. The idea is not an exclusively Americo-European one, and it's articulated most famously by Naguib Mahfouz in his short story of 1942, Sinuhe's Return. With sympathetic imagination, he focuses on the passage of time in the poem. When Sinuhe returns, he sees that the queen's youthful bloom has withered. Of her former loveliness, only faint traces remain. In this retelling, the reception of Sinuhe at court becomes a private meeting. The queen then spoke to him without concealing her astonishment. My God, is this truly our prince Sinuhe? And Mafuz gives her the final words of the story. Could it be that the agony of our long-ago love still toys with this ancient heart, so close to its demise? While Mufuza's Nefru is a romantic figure, she is presented as an individual with independent agency, as in what I think is the finest line of the story. Prince Sinuhe, you have told us your story, but do you know ours?
The idea of romance has also occurred to many commentators, including the Italian actor Orlando Mezzabotta and the Egyptologist Meltzer. And I discovered when working with the actress Barbara Ewing on a recording of the poem that this was an idea she found helpful to articulate the sense, the very real sense in the poem of something going on behind the words, a backstory that is so valuable to performance. And the persistence of this romantic idea for modern readers, both Egyptian and Americo-European, suggests that there is indeed something going on. The poem is absolutely haunted by the Queen. Luckily for her, the Queen does not directly feature in the post-war novel by Mika Valtari. Instead, that provides a whole range of females for the sex god Sinuhe to choose from. Valtari altered the setting into the Amarna period, meaning that the ruling Queen was the great Nefertiti, who was perhaps out of Sinuhe's league, even for an imaginative novelist. One film poster of the subsequent Hollywood epic shows the European face of Edmund Purdom surrounded by three embodiments of 1950s female film stereotype. The virtuous wife, who dies, the ambitious career woman, a princess, and the temptress. Her name is Nefer Nefer Nefer. So she is the woman that stands in for Queen Nefru. The queen has here been eroticized and exoticized into a courtesan. And this film has inspired many afterlives for Sinuhe, such as an act in the Red Cat Cabaret in Bratislava with the muscular Jakob Lorenkovic, an Egyptian pub, and even one of the corgis owned by Dirk Bogart, who turned down the role of Sinuhe and his life partner, Anthony Forwood. In this film reception, we can see the power of modern normative stereotypes. Sex has sold Sinuhe, and the royal lady vanishes in trivia. The royal lady has also vanished in a more recent literary treatment. In 2021, the young Vic staged a boldly reimagined version of the narrative by the Nigerian writer Ben Ock, Changing Destiny. This explores themes of migration and alienation and spiritual links with home. The fugitive nature of human certainties gives us cause to wonder. The urge to alter one's destiny in a world over which one has little control is as old as humanity itself, he writes. Okri made Amunenshi's daughter into a major role, Hotemi. She supports Sinuhe in the duel, kills an opponent herself, and rides to Egypt with a thousand soldiers to beg forgiveness from Pharaoh for Sinuhe. She brings the royal letter summoning Sinuhe home. This retelling has a powerful female part, and the play was staged in a gender-neutral manner, the male and female actors alternating the main roles. Although Sinuhe's marriage is made a central event, the figure of the queen is entirely omitted. Now, this might be read as another imposition of romantic norms onto the plot. A woman, after all, can only exist as a love interest or as a wife. But I think it is due to the fact that Okri's principal source was a children's retelling by Roger Lancelin Smith, in which the Queen and the royal children were only mentioned in passing. Green's omission of the court ritual of the original poem is understandable, given that this was a children's book focusing on the adventures of Sinuhe. Women are not needed for such schoolboy adventures. Now, the reviews of Okri's play have been unenthusiastic and show perhaps how the power of such an ancient work is not easily refashioned away from its original genres and culture. But anyway, to summarize, heteronormative Orientalism has often reduced Sinuhe's queen into a passive figure, romanced, orientalized, trivialized, and sometimes she has even vanished altogether. Women without romance do exist in Egyptian narratives, as in the autobiography of the 11th dynasty Redio Knum, narrating his career under his mistress and lady, the Queen Nefru Kayet, and his dependence on her royal favor. Marriage is mentioned in the poem only when it is a matter of social alliance and status, in line with contemporaneous autobiographies. And women feature in general as childbearers, spectators to male combat, and as assistants to the central male relationship between Sinuhe and his king Sinwasrit. And yet, the queen pervades the poem, even though she is not mentioned that often and never actually speaks, only one inarticulate, very great cry of shock in the recognition scene towards the end. But she starts early 
in the poem. She features first and is named in the opening verses, which presents Sanu his identity through his court title. And she only appears as an actor finally when he is re-established in court in that recognition scene. Now, the description of Sanu here as a servant of her private chambers has provoked discussions in Orientalist terms, with European imaginations dreadfully excited at the thought of Sinuhe working for Harim that was perhaps the source of the conspiracy to murder Amenemhat I, as described in the later teaching of Amenemhat, assessment of whose dating is, of course, very dependent on Oli's publications and research. Sinuhe's relationship to Nefru as servant is secondary in the poem to his role as follower of the king. His homosocial relationship with the king dominates the poem and is standard for self-presentations. An official's personal relationship with the king is acclaimed in the teaching of Cairis, and the fact that we know the name of the author of that teaching is, of course, due to Uli. In this, officials are urged to be close to his person in your hearts. Nevertheless, this central relationship between Sinuhe and the king is reinforced and mediated through the queen. As Blumenthal noted, the poet introduces Queen Nefru, like Amenemhat and St. Waswit, as if she is already dead, and in terms very similar to a later statue base for the historical queen at Sinai, dated to the reign of Amenemhat II. The poet associates Nefru with both of the kings, and they are mentioned for the first time in the poem here, and they are actually introduced through her. They are even made subservient to her in the hieratic orthography of the scribe of the 13th dynasty Ramesseum manuscript, who treated these titles as compounds, and so wrote a female determinative at the end of Royal Wife of St. Wadsworth. The queen is linked with the two kings specifically in their pyramid complexes. Amenemhat in his pyramid complex of Knumet Sut, joined of places, and St. Wazwit I in his pyramid complex of Karnefa, High of Beauty, both close to each other at Lish. These toponyms are well attested in contemporaneous inscriptions. But as the poem's text moves through history, the lady starts to vanish. I think this was probably due to the toponyms becoming unknown to readers and copyists, already quite early in the New Kingdom. Even in the 13th dynasty Ramesseum papyrus, Knumsut is not actually written as a toponym. The queen's name Nefru was still recognizable later. It was identified, albeit with a correction, through a female determinative in the late 18th dynasty papyrus Golinchev. And the distinctively female epithet Lady of Blessedness was still there in Senegem's copy from Dera Medina. But by, the, by then, the Ramazid version of the poem had turned her title of royal daughter of Amenemhat into royal son of Amenemhat. And in the Ashmolean Ostracon, her name and the toponym have become a garbled epithet of a royal son. The early New Kingdom manuscripts are irritatingly fragmentary, but the papyrus Galenishef has already reconfigured Sinuhe as a king's son, but it still recognizes Nefru as a female name. And so I think that the best understanding of this New Kingdom version of the text is the royal wife of St. Waswit, as she who joins the places of the royal son of Amenemhat, i.e. St. Waswit, in High of Beauty, Nefru, Lady of Blessedness. In later manuscripts, her name becomes either part of a toponym, Ka Nefer Neferu, as Frank Fader has suggested, or as an epithet of the royal son who is someone high of the beauty of beauties. But still, here it is followed by her final epithet, Lady of Blessedness, showing the scribes realized that the preceding phrases describe the queen of St. Wasrit. Only in the Ashmolean Ostracon does that final epithet vanish, and that may be due to individual scribal error rather than any redactional change. Now, these are petty philological details, but they show that the tendency of the queen to be written out of the poem does go a long way back. In the original poem, the juxtaposition of her name, Nefru, with the toponym Karnefa produced poetic wordplay. And I suspect that this poetic density was partly what confused the later copyists, as often happens elsewhere in the poem. Various forces, various forgettings caused her to become less familiar 
caused her to be written out and pushed into the background. Queen Nefru was a historical figure, although apparently an obscure one. She had a subsidiary pyramid in the complex of St. Waswit I at Licht, which reappears, of course, at the end of the poem, when Sinuhe is buried with the royal children there in this complex. Dieter Arnold notes, however, that few of the burial chambers of the subsidiary pyramids at Licht were used, and it seems that Queen Nefru was not buried here, but perhaps instead at the pyramid of her son Amenemhat II at Dashur. There are no surviving intact images of Nefru, and she is known only from inscriptions at Licht, but her images probably resembled a pair of statues from Tarnis, which show Queen Nefret, the wife of St. Wasret II, and Maspero originally associated these with Sinuhe's queen, hence Nofrit. When the queen next appears in the poem, it is after the central jewel, in a passage of nostalgia and longing for the Egyptian court. She is called the mistress of the land who is in his palace. Although the scribe of the Berlin Papyrus significantly uses the Uraeus determinative that he employs for the goddesses of the solar eye, merging the queen with the divine. And then Sinuhe prays that he will follow the lady of all and her children. The title also, with Uraeus determinative, is the female equivalent of the Lord of all that is used of both gods and the king, and is used especially of Sekhmet and Hathor as goddesses of the solar eye, and can be found in texts such as the Harpist Songs in the Tomb of Senate, which petition Hathor as Sekhmet the Great Lady of All. In the poem, the title refers to the queen. And she takes on an eternal role as her follower Sinuhe enters the afterlife as her servant. Such service by the deceased is evoked in coffin text spell 534, which is to be in the following of Hathor. And such spells may derive from the initiation of devotees to the goddess, the so-called bald heads of Hathor. Her otherworldly aspect continues as Sinuhe prays that she may pass eternity above me. A phrase that has double reference. It draws on the idiom to pass over, meaning to watch over, but it also alludes to her as Sinuhe's coffin lid, spending eternity above him as an embodiment of the sky goddess Newt. And this is taken up again in the king's letter when he mentions the queen as still being in the palace. This your heaven, who is in my palace, endures and flourishes today. Again, she is heavenly, enduring, a common idea of the heavens, and she is mentioned again with the royal children. It is they who will interact directly with Sinuhe as he returns, especially in that climactic recognition scene where the ritual is Hathori. Even though the queen is not an active figure or one who speaks, her effect on the reader is significant, chiming out like a bell throughout the poem. For all that the king is central, the poem is not a celebration of a monolithic masculinity. It is noticeable on a level of detail that the royal children shift from male to female in the poem. They are initially male military participants in St. Waswit's Libyan campaign, but they are implicitly female in the ritual scene, as imagined in this illustration by Flinders Petrie's illustrator. And despite Scott Morshower's ridiculous arguments that they are male royal guards who are offering help to subsidize Sinuhe's burial. That paper is not just reducing the female characters to the sidelines, as Guy Boothby did, but it erases them totally. And this view is backed by Hieratic and by the scribe's habits. He uses male determinatives for groups he considers to be exclusively male, and mixed gender determinatives for all the others. Here, at the start of the poem, in the military campaign, the royal children have male determinatives to indicate that he imagined them to be exclusively male. In all later passages, including the ritual scene, he used mixed gender determinatives for the children, showing that he envisaged them, at least some of them, as female. And this fits with visual representations of the Hathoric ritual that the royal children enact. The performers of such rituals are predominantly female, and men are only occasionally involved. In the tomb of Senbi the first of Mare, one male figure is shown presenting a menit and a sistrum to Senbi, but the majority, as you see here, are women. Men perform as clapper players, ihi, 
Wehminits, acting as representatives of Hathor's son, the child god Ihi. And here again, we see another of Uli's interests. In these rituals, Hathor's insignia of Menit and Sistra are offered to the tomb owner in order to ensure endurance, grace, and health. For your spirits, Menits of your mother Hathor, may she fell your enemy. The participants often use a particular ritual gesture to offer the Menit that is seen here in a tomb at Asyut. And Asyut is, of course, a site we very much associate with Uli's research and scholarship. The ceremony certainly derived from royal rituals, but it is found even in non nomarchal contexts, as on the funerary stela of Abkau, and it is later very frequently represented in New Kingdom Theban tombs. Royal daughters have a Hathoric ritual role at court, often connected with the king's jubilee. And this, I think, can be related to the burial of royal women inside 12th dynasty pyramid complexes surrounding the king. Royal children take part in the royal ritual of the dramatic Ramesseum Papyrus, where they are represented as female. In jubilee ceremonies in the tomb of Herueth, the royal children perform with Sistra in their hands. In a later hymn to the returning distant goddess in Medamud, the royal children pacify you, the goddess, with what is desired. In these rituals, they are representatives of the goddess Hathor, who, as Gardner suggested, is herself embodied in the many. In the tomb of Vizier Rekmire, women offer him Sistra, saying that the daughter of Re embraces your flesh. May you touch her while she puts her arms upon your chest. In a royal scene that is exactly contemporaneous with the main copy of Sinuhe, the goddess herself offers her Menit and Sistra to Amenemhat III with this ritual gesture. The same offering occurs much later in temple scenes of Hatshepsut at Elephantina and also in the Red Chapel, where the scene is accompanied by a fuller caption than elsewhere matching the poem. And again with Ramses II at Abu Simbel, and also with Seti I in his tomb, with a hint of erotic intimacy between the king and goddess. These visual parallels suggest that the poem narrates a standard courtly and cultic ritual and turns it into a distinctively individual experience. In a jubilee scene in Kerouf's tomb, the king is sitting with Hathor and is accompanied by the queen, suggesting the extent to which the two are complementary in this context, and clarifying the syntax of the ritual lyric in the poem. There the king is praised with hail to you as to the lady of all, meaning both that the king is praised as if he were the lady of all, but also that he is praised together with the queen as the lady of all. The queen is once again here, an embodiment of Sinuhe's divine patroness, and she assures his rebirth into Egyptian society by pacifying the king through the, her menit, which is offered to him by her children. As in the late Egyptian Horus and Seth, and again, I think of all his research, Hathor is a goddess who pacifies the sun god, and, as well as being herself pacified. Her role as the divine patroness of Sinuhe's rebirth has potentially erotic overtones, but any sexualized role that the queen might enact here as Hathor is present only in relation to the king. As a personification of Hathor, the queen is symbolically Sinuhe's mother here. But she is not just the decorative mythological embodiment of a male-centered plot. I suggest that she is the very heart of the plot. The queens of the early to mid-twelfth dynasty have, as Horvath notes, attributes comparable only with those of the king, including the Hathoric wig, and the royal uraeus, suggesting that they were presented as earthly incarnations of the goddess in her capacity as mother-daughter and consort of the sun god. This iconography may be an innovation of these reigns, or it may be a revival of Old Kingdom prototypes, as Biri Fay has argued. The main evidence for this occurs in the reigns close to the period of the poem's probable composition, and Hathoric motifs occur in the jewellery of the female members of the royal family, such as that of the royal child Sit Hathor Yunin. I suggest that the poet 
features the queen so extensively, not because she is personally important to the protagonist's love life, but because the queen was at that period a royal embodiment of Hathor, the goddess who was an aspect of the protagonist's identity. He is the queen's servant, and he is named Sinuhe, son of the sycamore, the quintessentially Egyptian tree and a tree sacred to Hathor. Sinuhe is a real name, of course, well known from Steely, including this rather cute 13th Dynasty baker on a stealer in Copenhagen. But that does not negate the name's ability to create poetic meaning. Hathor is an expression of the protagonist's identity, and thus his characterization. And it has long been noted that she is a goddess of foreign places, making her a very appropriate divine figure to evoke in a life story of travel. And she inhabits the landscape of the poem to a remarkable degree. On his flight, Sinuhe passes the sycamore shrine that was probably near Giza and where sycamores still grow. And then onwards to the Gebel Achma, which the poet describes as the Lady of the Red Mountain, an epithet of Hathor used to designate the location in later texts. The mountain is, I should say, still extremely red and extremely climbable. When Sinuhe is abroad, his narrative of travel uses Byblos as a reference point, and Hathor is, of course, the Lady of Byblos, as is featured in the highly literary inscription of Knuhotep at Darshur, roughly contemporaneous with the poem's main manuscript. And further, many incidental details in the poem can be read as possible allusions to the goddess. There are frequent mentions of cattle, including the fierce Nagao bull, and although these are usually in connection with bullfights, these male contexts are sometimes juxtaposed with Hathoric rituals. Even a passing reference to making beer as Sinuhe returns to Egypt can evoke the goddess. Sinuhe says that he sails to the capital with a kitchen boat beside him with kneading and brewing going on there, exactly as depicted in the models from the tomb of Meket Re, in which you can see the travelling bark and a kitchen boat with servants kneading and brewing. This is a return to good old Egyptian beer, after a life abroad with so much slightly suspicious foreign wine. But on a more elusive level, it is also a reference to the goddess herself, who was famously later pacified with red beer in the myth of the heavenly cow. Hathor is a central figure in that myth about the imperfection of the world that is also a major theme in the period's poetry, which concerns the thematically very relevant to Sinuhe's presentation of his own flawed and unstable life. Hathor features as the Eye of Re, the Lady of Malachite at Serebit el Khadim, and as such she is the distant goddess who must be pacified before she returns to Egypt. Although these myths about the journeying goddess are tested only much later, the distant goddess features in the rituals of the 12th dynasty tomb of Senet, where dancers cry, look, the golden one has come back. And similarly, at Lahun, there is mention of the first feast of drunkenness for the goddess. The ritual in the poem closely parallels the sorts of later rituals of appeasement for the returning goddess, such as feature in the much ritual studied by Dershin and Uli. And I almost wonder if in the poem the return of St. Wasra the I from a Libyan campaign might have alluded to these aspects of the wandering goddess. The ambivalent duality of the solar eye parallels and articulates the dual aspects of the king that structure the poem's main homosocial relationship. In the Middle Kingdom version of the teaching of Caeres, the dual aspects of the king, aggression and grace, are expressed through imagery of the goddess who takes contrasting form. He is a bastet who protects the two lands. The man who praises him will be sheltered by his arm. He is a sekmet against the man who transgresses his command. The man he disfavors will sink into distress. The final word of this passage is, incidentally, one that is used of Sinuhe the Wanderer in the New Kingdom version of the poem. And Sinuhe's eulogy of the king is similarly a bipolar presentation, switching from acclaiming St. Wasrit as a mass murderer to a lord of charm. And this eulogy is, of course, provoked by a question which evokes Sekhme. Then he said to me, So how is that land without him, that worthy God, fear of whom is throughout the countries like Sekhmets in a plague year? In the Hathoric ritual, 
the wild children voice the paradox of Sinuhe's identity most explicitly, most famously, in terms of his birth as a barbarian who is born in Egypt. They also provide a reconciling explanation of his flight, that he fled in loyal terror of the king, and they rename him as son of the north wind. This verse famously changes the illusion of Sinuhe's name from Hathor as the sycamore, Sanehet, into an allusion to her as goddess of the north wind, Samehit. And Samehit may well have sounded quite closely similar in a performer's mouth to Sanehi. And it is probably relevant that wind and trees are inherently compatible in nature with each other, as in a famous fragment of a Ramazid love song, where the wind is for the sycamore. The reconciliatory mythological paradox is that Hathor is both the lady of the sycamore and also lady of the north wind, as she is on this Middle Kingdom ship's finial. She both presides over Sinuhe's rebirth as an Egyptian and also his travels in the north. In Coffin Text Spell 162, the north wind is characterized very much as a traveling wind. It goes around the islands, opening its arms to the limits of the earth and sleeping only when it has brought what I desire every day. The north wind is the breath of life. In Samehit, the bee scribe wrote a male god determinative for the name of a goddess, as he often did when he was not using a serpent determinative. The one exception that he makes elsewhere to this is, of course, Hathor. Hathor is Sinuhe's mother, his patroness, the goddess of his home and travels, and the means through which the king is reconciled to him, and the means through which his paradoxical identity achieves some sort of stability, the means by which he is reborn in eternity. And in this severely naturalistic poem, the goddess remains off stage, but the queen acts as her embodiment, and as such, she dominates and pervades the poem. Overall, as Posner noted, the poem moves from military to a more domestic ethos, from aggression to grace. While these two modes of masculinity are fused in the figure of the king, the ideal of masculine dominance is presented in a problematic manner through the character and actions of Sinuhe himself. While the poem as a whole celebrates the power and brawn of the king, it provides other visions of masculinity and humanity. Masculinity is not taken as a given here. Cowardice and retreat are often presented in gendered terms as womanly, but femininity is positively valorized in the poem and grows increasingly influential. The royal children urge the king to put away his aggressive arrows and exchange them with glances. This alludes to Sekhmet as an archer goddess, drawing on the idea of Hathor as a goddess with dual aspect. Everything is articulated through the goddess. And the royal women's prayer for mercy is done in an apparently quintessentially female manner, according to the P.A. Stila, which describes a similar greeting and prayer for mercy in the manner of women. But might Nefru be little more than a necessity of the plot in a male-focused culture, as is arguably the case with the peasant's wife in the tale of the eloquent peasant? Read phenomenologically, the poem presents Nefru in a much more complex way. When she finally appears in the narrative, the queen is not only an embodiment of the cosmic Hathor, but a shockable, vocal human being. I think Mefruz was right to think of her as older and real. She is sublimely and abstractly powerful as an image of identity and home, but she is also a human, round character, like the narrator, and like Sun was, her one very great cry is an extreme expression of emotion, but of course the audience is not informed exactly what she feels. Her silence before and after this is not an expression of her lack of power, but it is arguably another of the poem's silences that engage the reader through what is left unsaid. The unspoken flight, the heart of the poem, engages us precisely because it is left undefined unarticulate and pervasive, and the queen is referred to, and finally appears only in the recognition scene and remains again unmentioned after that. The flight is mentioned time and time again, just as she is, and remains unresolved in the audience's mind, despite the princess's explanation.
always the poem means more than it says. And I note the use of passive constructions to describe royal actions, the various strategies that keep things veiled, creating tension and dramatic uncertainty and engagement. I think it's clear from the first part of this talk that the Queen's haunting presence has captured readers' imagination. And so this strategy by the poet has proved to be extremely effective. Anyway, that is one reading of parts of a poem. And I hope you can see how much of its thinking is indebted to the wide range of Uli's work, as indeed all of my career has. I hope this reading goes a little beyond the usual stereotypes of gender that have shaped many early receptions. And one can perhaps think of the implications the Queen has for our own Egyptological identity, aiming for something not heroic or testosterone-filled, a more inclusive vision of academic humanity, not an alpha male adventure, but something more human, supportive, and collaborative that for me is embodied in the study of a moving hand and a pen that gives access to how individuals thought about their own culture and history. That for me is a more exciting and inspirational sort of Egyptology. And it is one, of course, that has been supremely embodied and championed here at Mainz. So to go back to Hieratic one more time, let me say with those royal children, hail to you, Uli even as to the lady of all.